Good afternoon and welcome. We are just waiting for a few seconds for people to join the room. Thank you very much for being with us today for a very important conversation. Um, I'm just, uh, all right, let's get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Melissa Hafaf. I'm the Program Director for the Gender Justice Initiative here at Georgetown in Washington, DC. We are a cross-campus effort whose mission is to support and nurture research as well as um, projects related to intersectional gender justice. Uh, feel free to visit our website for information. And um, we are also happy to collaborate on events and programs. So if you have any ideas, suggestions, please feel free to reach out. Um, Today, we are delighted to uh, partner with uh, a Georgetown Law organization, uh, If, When, How, the Georgetown Law chapter, chapter uh, to offer this uh, conversation to you today. Uh, before we start, uh, keep in mind that uh, you can ask questions all throughout the, the conversation um, by using the Q&A function, um, which should be down there. Uh, our moderator will try to uh, take them all. Uh, also, for those who ask questions before um, or upon registration, we were able to integrate most of them into the first part of the conversation. There were a lot, a lot of questions, over 80. So if you don't see your question, um, please feel free to ask it again so we can um, hopefully get to it on, in the second part. And now let me introduce the moderator for the conversation, who is Professor Naomi Mezzi, who is also the co-director for the Gender Justice Initiative, um, and who is also a law professor at the Gender Justice, uh, oh, at the Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you. We can <laughs> rename the school to the Gender Justice Law School. Right, so. it would be yeah. great. <laughs> we would love that. Thank you, Naomi. I think Melissa may be having some. Uh, introduce three really amazing panelists. We're so delighted to have you here with us. Anna Rupani is the executive director of Fund Texas Choice. It's an organization that helps Texans equitably access abortion through safe, confidential, and comprehensive travel services and practical support. I'm also really happy to have Stephen Vladek. He's the Charles Allen Wright Chair in Federal Courts at the University of Texas School of Law. He's also a nationally recognized expert on the federal courts, constitutional law, national security law, and military justice. Callie Wells is Policy Counsel for Planned Parenthood Federation of America, a nonprofit organization that provides sexual health care in the United States and around the world. Um, Kali, uh, Stephen, and I'm really so grateful that you could be with us uh, to talk to us about SB8 and its effects today. I thought what I would do is to just get us started is describe the Texas abortion law, um, it, just sort of what it says it does, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what were um, some of the effects it's having with the panelists. So SB8, the Texas abortion law, has two, two really main parts to it. The first is a fairly, within the universe of challenges to Roe, it's a fairly standard ban on early abortions. It's a fetal um, heartbeat bill. And it bans a physician from performing or inducing an abortion after detection of a fetal heartbeat. And that's, it's been, in the press, it's been called a six week ban because the uh, fetal heartbeat is typically audible after six weeks after the pregnant woman's last menstrual cycle or four weeks into the pregnancy. Um, the really chilling part of the law, and I do mean chilling in both the psychological and legal senses of the word, um, is its enforcement mechanism. This is the, 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 the part that has really generated most of the buzz and some of its um, most insidious effects. It specifically prohibits um, public enforcement of the law. So any Texas official cannot uh, move to enforce it. 
Instead, it authorizes private citizens to bring civil actions against anyone who performs an abortion, attempts to perform an abortion, or assists or aids anyone in performing an abortion or accessing abortion. And the law specifically mentions financial assistance as one of those um, acts of aiding or abetting. Um, private citizens then are deputized by Texas to enforce the law and sue abortion providers or those who aid or abet them. And if they win, the court is required to award them a minimum of $10,000 for each abortion that the defendant abortion provider has performed or any other defendant has uh, aided or assisted in, as well as attorney's fees. And the law specifically prohibits pregnant women themselves from being sued. And lastly, and just in case the law didn't seem sufficiently contemptuous of constitutional rights or the rule of law, it says that it's not a defense that the providers who are sued believe that the law is unconstitutional or that it will violate the rights of third parties, nor is it a defense that the abortion was allowed by a court decision when it was performed if that court decision is subsequently overruled and you have four years in which to bring such an action. Um, as, as some of you may have read already in, in the newspapers, the first couple of suits have already been brought by plaintiffs outside Texas, both disbarred attorneys, by the way, um, against a San Antonio abortion provider who admitted to performing abortions that are prohibited by the law. So that I hope just gives us, and, and I wanna in, invite all of the speakers to correct uh, any um, sort of errors or uh, any, er, any errors or other kinds of misstatements you think I made with respect to the law. Um, but I wanna turn first to Ana Rupani and, and really just ask, you're there, uh, right in the middle of the Texas abortion fight. And um, we'd love to hear from you about what you're seeing on the ground in Texas, especially since September 1st and what it has meant for both abortion providers and abortion seekers. Can we maybe start there? Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about to kind of share what we've been seeing. Um, so as Naomi mentioned, um, we, serve Texans who are trying to get to their abortion. Um, so we do provide um, travel assistance, whether that's a flight, a bus ride, ride share, gas money. Um, we'll help with the hotel accommodations. We'll give you meal stipends, um, kind of all of um, whatever it might mean from booking the appointment to getting to the appointment. Um, we'll support except the only thing we don't fund is the actual abortion procedure and we'll work with abortion funds to basically get you the procedure funding that you need. Um, so we'll make sure you have the right connections um, and contacts ready to go for that. Um, so we like to refer to practical support is what that's referred to. And that's basically referred to as like the backbone um, of abortion, because if you can't afford your abortion, you likely can't get to your abortion. Um, so that's kind of what what we do and the reason I am trying to kind of tell y'all in detail what we do is because it kind of helps you see what we've seen since September 1st and even what we saw before September 1st. So leading up to September 1st, um, we had several clinics, we were working with several clinics who were adding more staff so that Texans that needed to get care before September 1st could get care. Um, and right now we're a team of two, including me, um, which is not a lot, um, but we are the only statewide practical support organization. So we serve the entire state of Texas. Um, and if you wanna understand how large Texas is, you could drive in Texas for 10 hours and still be in Texas. Um, so that's what the area we cover is very large. Um, so we normally serve, we would normally serve six to 10 clients a week um, leading up to September 1st, the three, the, the three weeks in August, we served over 20 clients a week leading up to September 1st um, because we wanted to make sure Texans were getting care um, before September 1st happened. Um, and 30 to 35% of our clients were already leaving the state. Um, and after SB8 was enacted, 100% of the clients we have served since September 1 have left the state to access care. Um, so that's a significant um, increase in what 
in folks seeking care outside of Texas. Um, and that kind of matches up with the numbers folks were saying that 85 to 90% of Texans would have to leave the state um, if this ban were to go into effect because most of the clients don't realize they're pregnant until post six weeks. Um, so um, just in sheer numbers, we're three times more sending folks out of state. Um, we used to receive 10 to 15 calls a week um, for clients needing help. We're receiving 15 to 20 calls a day um, for clients seeking to get out of the state. And we obviously don't have the actual capacity um, to do that. Um, not in terms of dollars, but also in terms of people to serve 20 clients a day. Um, we did ramp up where three new staff members are going to be starting next week, so we can address that need. Um, but that does mean that the need is very high um, and Texans are probably going unserved. Um, so that's kind of like some of what we've seen. Um, and our clients are, are traveling close to 1200 miles round trip um, to get to their care and back, which is pretty significant. Um, and prior to SB, our clients were traveling around 600 miles round trip. So it's nearly doubled. Um, and the cost has also tripled. Um, so clients, we were spending around $300 if they were staying in Texas to get care. Um, we're spending over a thousand dollars on clients' care. So it's been pretty significant. Um, and so Clients are calling us kind of frantic about how they're gonna get an appointment and where they're gonna get an appointment. Um, and when we see clients, we would see clients not wanting to do the long trip um, to say from Dallas to Houston, um, which is about four hours. Um, but now they're willing to do 12 hours round trip um, because Dallas to Houston felt more comfortable and going elsewhere into a different state with no relatives, no friends is a lot harder. Um, and so they might do the trip within a day, um, which we don't recommend, but obviously we also recommend, we also respect um, our clients' autonomy to be able to do that. Um, so we've seen kind of a lot of folks be really frantic and really upset. And then we've also heard clients not being able to get appointments until November, um, November and December, which is really far out. And that's because um, in clinics in the surrounding states, um, because Texas has a huge population. Um, and they said there's about 7 million folks that could be seeking an abortion. And so that's 7 million folks that could potentially be being dispersed to the states near us. Um, and so we've seen clients go as far northwest as Seattle um, and as far east as DC already. Um, so it's been pretty far for clients. Um, and they've, they've kind of been trying to do what they can. Um, and we've been trying to work with as many clinics as we can and then as many abortion funds as we can to support clients. Um, but that has meant that we've had to work with other practical support organizations to support the ones that we can't serve. Um, but that's like, that is what is happening on the ground. Um, in terms of like what we have seen for clients themselves, like I, I I can't underscore the gravity of this law um, without kind of sharing a story. Um, and some of you might've already heard this from me, but I, if you haven't, um, we had a client, um, and before I start the story, I just want everyone to understand that abortion was already hard to access in Texas. It has become nearly impossible. Um, and so that's something just to keep in mind when I say like the, the story. So we had a client reach out to us. She had her, um, first appointment on August 31st. Um, and when I say first appointment in Texas, you are required to wait 24 hours um, after um, getting a sonogram um, to get an abortion. So you're forced to undergo a, a transvaginal sonogram, wait 24 hours, and then can you actually seek your abortion? So our client traveled um, to a different city to go to the clinic um, and get a sonogram. Um, on August 31st. On August 31st, there was not um, cardiac fetal um, embryonic activity. That was just, that didn't exist on August 31st for her. Um, she had to wait the 24 hour waiting period, went back to the clinic on September 1st when S8 was enacted. They did another sonogram to confirm whether or not there was actual cardiac embryonic fetal activity. There was, um, and she was denied an abortion on September 1st, but had she been able to access that abortion on August 31st, she would have been able to get it. Um, and, and that was just a matter of hours, um, less than 24 hours. And so um, to underscore kind of what that means for her, she drove, 
200 miles round trip um, to her appointment. Um, she stayed in the city. We, we covered all of that. And then when and then when she found out she couldn't get an abortion, she was devastated and she cried um, and didn't have the capacity to kind of think about, I need to reschedule this. She was finally able to get an abortion last Friday. She was supposed to get it on September 1st. Um, and she traveled a thousand miles round trip. And by the way, she missed two days of work the first time, missed three days of work this time. Um, and so that so that's just kind of like one story of what we're seeing. Um, and there are several like that. So um, that's been really hard for us um, because our clients are upset. Our clients are frantic. Our clients are frustrated. Um, and it does require so much more than would it would have Otherwise, especially if you live in cities like Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, where clinics are readily available, um, maybe they can't get the appointment, but you can just drive down the road um, and you wouldn't have to really miss all that time and use all that travel time. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, that, that's a heartbreaking story and particularly because the limitations that caused all of that burden are flagrantly unconstitutional. Um, so, which I don't want to lose track of, but before we turn to Steve Vladek, I did want to just ask a quick follow-up, which is what, I mean, I'm assuming that the kinds of support you're providing is um, covered under the law or may be <laughs> covered under the law, depending on how a court in Texas interprets the law. And I'm wondering whether, and so I'm wondering what kinds of activities you take, if you take any, to try and avoid liability and what you're seeing among pro abortion providers to try and um, evade the sort of dragnet quality of the law. Yeah, so um, we believe what we're doing is in compliance with the law because we are not serving anyone beyond six weeks to seek an abortion in Texas. So if someone calls us and they're beyond six weeks or they said I had a sonogram and they said they can't get me an abortion, we won't help them get to an abortion in Texas. We'll help them get to an abortion outside of Texas. So we truly believe we're not violating or doing anything that would even remotely cause um, pause to anyone that's trying to sue us. Does that mean we won't get sued? Probably not. I, I suspect that we're going to get sued because we're helping Texans get abortions. And um, even if it's not in Texas, uh, but I suspect that that's going to happen because that is what um, we're seeing um, from the right to lifers that they're targeting um, groups like mine. They're targeting organizations like mine and abortion funds who are making sure these abortions happen still. Um, so we're probably going to have to deal with that. And that we do think that that would be a frivolous lawsuit, but that does mean, as you said, that um, if we get into a courtroom in a town um, that is anti-abortion um, and judges are elected in Texas, please remember that. So um, like if we are in a small town that is anti-abortion, we could see problems for ourselves because we might have to deal with how that judge or that court interprets the law. Um, but I do, again, we're after talking to our own attorneys and talking to other folks, we do really believe that we aren't violating the law and we are complying with not helping Texans seek abortion in Texas um, because of this law, which is very unfortunate, um, but it is our workaround. I will say abortion, there are several abortion providers that are not providing at all in Texas. Um, they're not doing sonograms. They're not, um, they're not providing abortions even before, um, cardiac fetal um, embryonic activity because they don't, um, they don't, they, they're, they're not sure where the gray line is because the law is so big. Um, from our perspective, um, if we don't do this because we're, the law is so big, clients can't get to abortion. So we're kind of doing it and hoping that the law will, un like, that that the person who's going to analyze the law, if we were to ever be sued, wouldn't um, find us in violation um, of the law. But we have, you know, we've created um, kind of disclaimers. We actually talk to clients and let them know we won't be able to support them in Texas if they're beyond a certain time frame. Um, we um, we also 
say things like you're not recording this call, are you? Because we want to make sure that um, they're, if an anti reaches out to us, they're not trying to use any of the things they've talked to us about. So we've gone through kind of all of that and we've set up security in all our, all, all our staff's homes and things like that to kind of make sure that there aren't, there isn't any harassment happening in between um, because it looks like there's a possibility of that happening too. Thank you, um, Anna, for that. I want to, Steve, I want to turn to you for a minute and, and, and really ask you sort of, so Chief Justice Roberts says in his dissent to the order of the court refusing to block enforcement of SB8, that the law is not just unusual, that it's unprecedented. And I wanted to ask how unprecedented it is. And I and I'm specifically here, I'm thinking about that enforcement mechanism and the, the private uh, citizen enforcement. And um, sort of, have we seen anything like this before historically, but also, you know, the, the part of the reason we've titled the panel the way we have is it looks like a form of institutionalized vigilantism and um, and attempt to evade judicial review. So I would love you, for you to just sort of discuss that provision, both sort of historically and currently. Um, yeah, thanks, Naomi. I mean, the I, I'm mindful that we're not all lawyers, and and one of the things that I think is the hardest for non-lawyers to understand about SB8 is how very carefully calibrated it is to exploit a series of legal technicalities. Um, and so the sort of the, the vigilante enforcement mechanism is actually simply the byproduct of the real sort of technical legal procedural complexities that were deliberately baked into the bill. Um, in other words, right, naming that the, the bounty hunters are just sort of the icing on the cake. The real issue is that the state has divested itself of enforcement responsibility. They had to give it to somebody else. Um, but the, for, for, for sort of doctrinal purposes, it was the state taking itself out of the story that matters. So let me back up a second. There's, um, there is a pretty robust tradition, certainly in the last 100 years, of what the lawyers call pre-enforcement review, um, where states pass statutes that are you know, seemingly unconstitutional um, and where the Supreme Court has recognized that allowing those statutes to go into effect um, will have serious harms, um, especially if there's such a strong argument that they're unconstitutional on their face, meaning that they can't be constitutionally applied to anybody. Um, and I think, you know, we should all be clear, SB8 is unconstitutional. I mean, the, you know, Roe and Casey are still the law of the land, at least for now. A state legislature has no power to disagree with that. Um, in that respect, right, SB8 is ripe, or at least should have been ripe for a pre-enforcement challenge. The reason why so many of the more restrictive anti-abortion bills that state legislatures have passed in recent years have never gone into effect is because they've all been blocked by federal courts um, through pre-enforcement review. Um, the whole sort of point of SB8 is to frustrate pre-enforcement review. Um, and it does so cynically by basically depriving providers who are otherwise the proper plaintiffs of defendants to sue. Um, you can't sue the Attorney General of Texas, even though he is normally the chief law enforcement officer. Can't sue the Governor of Texas. Can't sue the Secretary of State. You know, maybe there are hypothetical people who are going to be these bounty hunters, but you can't sue them because you don't know that they're going to enforce until they actually do it. And then they may get to the flip side, which is even once SB8 is in effect, defenses will not be complete. Um, providers can win every single one of these cases, and it won't stop the next case from happening. And it won't stop the providers from having to um, pay their own costs and fees, even for frivolous cases, when in our federal system, usually you're not on the hook um, when parties file frivolous cases. So I, the key is that these are all deliberate moves meant to exploit either um, settled doctrines in the federal appeals court that covers Texas, the Fifth Circuit, or unanswered questions. And in that respect, I, I think there are two things that need to be said. One. That is a horrifying precedent, wholly apart from abortion. Um, that is to say that you know there's nothing about this procedural Rube Goldberg device that is abortion specific. Um, if a state can do this to abortion, it can do this to other constitutional rights. It can create a regime where the state passes a restriction, it divests itself of any responsibility for enforcing the restriction, 
and we're stuck in the same sort of vicious cycle. Um, and I would have thought that that problem, that that very real specter, that a universe in which our constitutional rights are no better than what 50 state legislatures say they are, um, would have been one that even, you know, sort of critics of the Supreme Court's abortion jurisprudence um, would find discomfort in. Um, and I think one of the most alarming features to me of all of the SB8 stuff is how untroubled um, by the systemic effects of this kind of approach, those who just don't like abortion have been. Um, the, the principles we're willing to sacrifice because we just don't like Roe. Um, the, this leads to the Supreme Court, right? So the, the, the providers still tried to bring a pre-enforcement suit. Um, they named eight defendants, including um, a state court judge as a putative representative of all of the judges in the state of Texas, a state court clerk as representative of all the clerks in the state of Texas, a couple private defendants, a couple of state officers. Um, and that case was moving along. Um, and the district court here in Austin had denied the defendant's motion to dismiss and was scheduled to hold a preliminary here, uh, a hearing on a preliminary injunction for the non lawyers, basically a hearing to decide whether to block the law before it goes into effect. Um, and that was scheduled for August 30th. So Monday, you know, 48 hours, 30, 40 hours before the law was supposed to go into effect. Um, the previous Friday, the Fifth Circuit, a very, very conservative federal appeals court covers Texas. Um, issued an administrative stay that blocked the district court, that stopped the district court from holding that hearing on Monday. And it was from that ruling that the providers asked the Supreme Court to intervene, either to reach out and block SBA directly, basically to do what the district court was going to do, or at least to knock out the Fifth Circuit stay so the case could go ahead in the district court. And midnight on September 1st came and went, and the Supreme Court didn't do anything. And then at 1158 Eastern the next night, right, we got the one paragraph order where the court says, oh, there are hard questions here about who a proper defendant is, um, which, of course, was the whole point. Um, and so you mentioned, Naomi, I think quite rightly, Chief Justice Roberts' dissent. I mean, I think his dissent is especially telling because he is no fan of the court's abortion jurisprudence. And even he understood exactly why it was so problematic for the court to let Texas get away with it. Because if Texas can get away with it here, Texas can do this to other rights. Florida can do this. California can do this. Um, and then we don't have one Supreme Court. We have 50 state legislatures. Um, and that's just a system. I mean, as I said at the hearing the Senate Judiciary Committee held yesterday, that's a system that's not the rule of law. That's a system that's the rule of, you know, the men in the state legislatures. Thank you um, for a incredibly depressing recap of the the <laughs> SBA's reception at both the Fifth Circuit and the and the Supreme Court, and the and the very clear description of how the bill kind of weaponizes this procedural anomaly that it it bakes into the legislation. Um, so, I think a lot of people had questions prior to you know when they signed up asking about what this meant for like how how can we what does this mean right this was a again a page and a half or something including the dissent um and how much meaning can we ascribe to it and it it does seem particularly alarming that even if they weren't willing to rebuff Texas's kind of um, blatant disregard for constitutional rights in this way, that that they also weren't willing to to take an action to preserve what would seem to be the integrity of the court, which is why I would assume Justice Chief Justice Roberts is in the dissent here. So. Um, I'm sort of curious how you read this very small and unreasoned order, and if we can take anything about it as um, indication of what the future of Roe is. So, I, um, Naomi, I, I, I put a link in the chat that has the actual ruling so folks can, can see it for themselves. Um, so I think there are two different things to say there. With regard to what this portends for Roe, um, you know, the majority goes out of its way to say the 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 providers have raised serious constitutional questions um, right about the about the statute. Um, they went out of their way to sort of not prejudge those questions and sort of not, you know, poo poo them. Um, and so I, I think it is a mistake to portray the decision as formally 
um, and legally eviscerate in Roe? Um, because it doesn't. I mean, if the court wants to turn around in the Mississippi case that it's scheduled to hear on December 1st, which is about Mississippi's 15-week ban, and somehow strike down the Mississippi ban, um, nothing that they did in the SB8 case will stop them, right? There's, there's no respect in which that would be inconsistent. Um, the problem is that is, is twofold. One, in practice, that is a distinction without a difference to Texans, um, right? That, that the fact that Roe is still on the books doesn't mean that Texans today can avail themselves of their constitutional right to obtain a pre-viability abortion after the six week of pregnancy. Um, and so law on the books versus law on the ground, you know, we talk about this a lot. Um, in practical terms, that's a pretty big distinction. But, but two, I think it also like, it's hard to imagine the same justices um, sitting on their hands, feeling themselves, you know, tied up, handcuffed by these deliberately manufactured procedural contrivances if they cared more about the right, um, right? And indeed, we I can point to cases where the opposite was true, where Justices Alito and Gorsuch criticized New York for manufacturing procedural obstacles to review of a gun law, um, right? Where, you know, they have just ignored procedural obstacles to grant the same kind of emergency relief on the shadow docket through these emergency applications to protect religious liberty. And so, you know, there's nothing here that is formally bad for Roe and Casey, but there's everything possible that is informally bad for it. Um, and, you know, sort of suggesting that the court just doesn't care about abortion and is therefore willing to abide things that, I mean, I, I ask, you know, the, those conservatives who are vocally defending what the court did in the SBA case, I ask them, do you honestly believe that the same court would have done the same thing if this were California and guns. Um, we all know what the answer to that question is. Thanks, Steve. I wanna just follow up with one um, question that was in the Q&A um, that's sort of right in your wheelhouse, which is really about the DOJ action um, and the their lawsuit against Texas and what that actually means about whether they, you know, how that works um, and and how it's designed to get around some of the problems with this underlying suit, the whole women's health versus Jackson. Yeah, so the federal government brought its own suit against Texas um, about a week and a half ago, um, two weeks ago, I guess, and then and has since moved for a preliminary injunction. Judge Pittman, same judge, is scheduled to hold a hearing on the government's motion for preliminary injunction tomorrow. Um, it is possible that by the end of the day tomorrow, there will be an injunction against SB8, although that will just set off another trip up to the Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court, I don't think, is done with SB8. Um, th there are sort of a series of technical doctrinal reasons why the federal government is in slightly better position to challenge SB8. And then there are a couple of ways in which they're actually in a worse position. Um, so the, the, the most important better position is that the federal government is not limited as the providers are by something called the doctrine of sovereign immunity. Um, in other words, right, that the federal government is allowed to sue Texas itself, as opposed to officers of the state of Texas, where private parties like the abortion providers are not. Um, and that's because of a series of old Supreme Court cases, the first of which is called the United States versus Texas, um, that stand for the proposition that states do not have immunity when they're sued by the federal government. Um, that gets around a couple of the doctrinal contrivances, um, right? And it sort of it clears away a couple of these procedural roadblocks. Um, the other piece is that even more in the weeds, there's a statute called the Anti-Injunction Act, which limits the circumstances where federal courts can actually block ongoing proceedings in state courts. Um, that doesn't apply if the federal government is the plaintiff. Um, so those are ways in which the federal government is better situated. Um, there are hard questions about the federal government's standing, that is to say, the federal government's injury that is distinct that allows it to sue as opposed to the providers who we all agree is injured, um, are injured. Um, and then there's a, there's a really sort of nerdy question about what cause of action the federal government has, whether they're allowed to sue to enforce constitutional rights whenever they want, um, or whether there's something specific here that justifies the suit. Um, but it really, Naomi, I think, comes down to the same question in both cases, which is who can the court enjoin that will actually allow the providers to reopen? That is to say, how can the court issue an injunction that's going to prevent future SB8 lawsuits from even being filed? 
and I think that question actually is implicated to equal extents in both cases. It just might be easier for the court to get to that question um, in the federal government's case because of the, the, the sort of the ways in which the federal government is differently situated. Thank you. That's tremendously helpful. Um, Holly Wells, let me turn to you and and ask you, you're, you know, looking around the country at what's going on. And, and I would love to hear an overview of what you're seeing, both in terms of copycat legislation, um, but what's sort of coming down the pike um, proactively as well. And just give us a sense of what's what's happening in other states and to what extent is this structure this very anomalous structure um being copied and and passed through other state legislatures sure um i think it's helpful to have a short kind of understanding of how state legislatures work um i know that and when i started working in state policy i didn't quite fully recognize the way that they function and how they pass laws um so in general, and this is a little bit of good news, most states pass laws only a, a few months of the year. They're in session a few months of the year um, and they can introduce bills and pass them within a few months. And if they don't pass while the state's in session, they ultimately then end up reintroducing the bill the next year if they would like to. Um, so the bit of good news is that most states are not in session right now. In general, it is most common for states to be in session from around the beginning of the year through around March, April, May, June, depending on the length of their session. Um, so while we do expect there to be copycat bills of Senate Bill 8, well, there's not a huge influx of them just now. Now there are certain exceptions to that and states can call special sessions. Um, and some, a few states have year long sessions or allow early introduction of bills. So that tees up our first copycat bill that we've already seen now, um, it is in Florida. It is very similar to SB8, um, it's House Bill 167. Um, oftentimes what states will do is um, state legislators, they really, they're not experts in every aspect of the law. Some of them, it's not even their full-time job. So they're often fed material and bill language from groups, interest groups that support them. Um, so when we have um, legislators that traditionally align as anti-choice, they will often introduce very, very similar bills. They're not, they're writing their own versions. They're introducing um, bills that they've seen other places and that they've been fed. So there is a model bill that's modeled after Senate Bill 8. Um, and we expect that multiple states will introduce that language. Um, it is very similar to SB 8. It essentially just takes out Texas and takes out references to Texas law um, and says sort of like, insert your state here. Um, Florida's bill that they've introduced is slightly different than that model bill, and it is slightly different than SB8. Um, the most noteworthy difference is that while SB8 allows the, the private right enforcement for the cardiac activity ban, the Florida version of the bill um, would actually allow the private right of action to be kicked in for violations of any aspect of the abortion code, which is a much broader private right of action. Um, that basically means that while the bill itself is banning abortion after cardiac activity is detected, if somebody is providing care or expected of aiding and abetting care that violates any aspect of the abortion code in Texas, they could face us a, um, a lawsuit from a civilian. Um, so we likely will see that language elsewhere as well. That, that language was initially in SB8. It was amended out before the bill was ultimately enacted. Um, so some of the copycat bills could ultimately have the same language as Florida. I will say we do not necessarily expect Florida to pass this bill. And that's key to understand that a lot of states will introduce this bill and it won't ultimately pass. Um, to put it in perspective, there were 380 anti-abortion bills introduced this session. Um, so there are hundreds of anti-abortion bills. They get introduced in very blue states. They get introduced in very red states. We expect many more will be introduced than will ultimately pass. Um, there, right this minute, we're watching a few different states um, for a multitude of reasons. Some have already had legislatures that it, or legislators who have mentioned that they want to introduce an SB8 type bill. Some were flagging because they have upcoming special sessions. Um, so that list 
and this is obviously could be subject to change, but sort of our key red flag states right now are Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, and Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Kentucky, Mississippi, Missouri, Nebraska, Ohio, and South Dakota. Um, I mostly just list those to give a concept of the breadth of this. This will not be isolated. Other states will pass this bill. Um, the good-ish news about this is that people are awake now. Everyone is paying attention to this. Um, when SB8 passed in Texas, it was, as Steve mentioned, it's complex because on its face, it looks like a six week or cardiac activity ban. Um, but the, the thing that made it really unique was it's legalese, it's tricky, it's hard to understand and digest. It's not a obvious media um, headliner. And when it's one of 380 bills introduced, it's much easier to see a news article that is focused on Arkansas passed a total ban on abortion than it is to say, Texas passed this weird six week ban, but pay attention to it. It's got this tricky thing about private rights of action. Um, so it really didn't get much press or media or attention until it was being enacted and people realized what it really meant. Other states that are now going to try to pass this, they won't have that luxury of sort of passing it in the dark when people aren't watching. Um, and that will be key in sort of trying to discourage legislators from actually pushing and passing this bill. Um, people are watching. Um, now, in a lot of these states, the, the Republicans have a supermajority, and there's really not much that even with that media pressure that folks can do um, to fight against them if they desperately do want to pass this bill. And one thing that we're, we're quite worried about is that there will be actually sort of an influx of what we're now calling regular bans. And legislators will be saying, well, we proposed a private right of action ban and a regular six week or 13 week or 15 week ban. We're gonna pass that ban. It's not even extreme. That somehow this is, this is shift the marker for what is seen as an extreme abortion ban. Um, and so I think in general, while yes, we will see some SB8 copycat bills pass, we're also going to see a plethora of other abortion attacks um, that are now marketed as less extreme. Um, the good news, as you mentioned, there are proactive efforts in other states. So um, it, there are plenty of states that don't support SB8, that don't want their state to pass something like that, and ultimately want to do what they can to protect abortion rights. Um, while we have been discouraging of the concept of trying to get at Texas or get at extraterritorial care um, or reach, because we don't support the concept that one state should be able to interfere with the law and access in another state. Um, there are things that states can do to improve access in their own states and to prepare for a situation in which there are more people who need to travel to get abortion care. Um, so for example, some things that blue states um, are considering are things like removing residency requirements for Medicaid eligibility so that it's possible if people need to travel to their state, they can um, be enrolled in Medicaid to receive help paying for abortion care in that state. Um, removing some um, counties are even considering setting up their own county abortion funds to help people come travel to their counties to receive abortion care. Um, and then there are, there are really a host of other ways that states can make it easier for people to access care in their state. And that's really what matters the most. Things, just logistical processes. I mean, we heard from Anna how complex it can be to get an abortion. In Texas, even states that support rights to abortion have limitations um, and have restrictions and have requirements. They might require laboratory testing be done before abortions. Um, they might have limitations on which services can be provided via telehealth. Um, and so we're encouraging states to really, that want to do something, that want to fight for access, to look back closely at their laws and see which of those laws they can push to repeal. Um, the one other thing that I'll flag is crisis pregnancy centers. Um, they, are, they outnumber abortion providers in our country three or four to one. Um, in Texas, that number is much higher. So we're seeing people within Texas often, they're getting their initial visit from a CPC that's telling them, oh, based on a urine test, you're five weeks and six days because they, they don't want people to have access to abortion care in Texas, even if they're before six weeks. So they have every incentive to mislead patients. Um, and those CPCs in Texas, people are ending up having to go out of state, even if they potentially would have been able to have an abortion in Texas because they're, they don't understand their gestational age or they've been misinformed. Um, but CPCs exist in other states too. And as we see folks going out of state to receive care, one thing that we're quite concerned about is people ending up at CPCs thinking that they're going to be able to get an abortion out of state. 
Um, so it is it is tricky to limit the ability of CPCs um, to function and to provide care. They have First Amendment rights, and they're often not violating any actual licensure requirements in the state. Um, so, and state action that has tried to um, protect folks against being misled from CPCs has been blocked by courts in the past, but there are certain things that we can do. Connecticut actually just passed a good advertising bill about um, limiting CPC advertisements. So other states that can do what they can to be purposeful in, in making sure that folks who may need to travel for abortions understand what facility they're visiting and what services they might have access to is another proactive effort that we're that we're seeing. And I, if you don't mind, I just want to chime in about the CPC issue. Like that is a very real issue. We had a client pre SB8 come to us, and they thought they were 11 weeks pregnant. They were 18 weeks pregnant. Um, and Texas has a 20 week deadline um, pre September one. Um, and so they couldn't. By the time everything was said and done, they couldn't get an abortion in Texas either. Um, so. The point of laws like this and the point of CPCs and everything is to frustrate the system and frustrate folks that can support um, pregnant people out of business. Um, it is, it is th that is the intention, right? The cruelty is the point. And the reason things like this exist is because eventually if I get sued enough times, I will be out of the dollars to help my clients. If, um, if clinics can't do work, they may never come back, right? Um, FTC was founded in response to a crisis um, as a law that was um, passed in 2013 in Texas to frustrate the system. Um, and we had, there was 44 clinics in Texas. And by in 2013, by the time the law was enacted, um, a year later, there was only eight in Texas. And so the point is to kind of continue to frustrate the system so folks don't access care. Um, and Callie's right. We had a client that thought she had an appointment in Oklahoma with an abortion clinic and it was with a CPC. So um, it, it's very real and it's meant to make things confusing so folks can't get the care they need or um, access the care they need. And it impacts particular groups the most. So it impacts Black, Indigenous, and other people of color um, and LGBTQIA folks and low income folks pretty significantly. Um, and if they're already struggling, it continues to add to that struggle. That's really helpful. And, and one of the questions that I think many people might have is, so what actions can be taken against CPCs? What's the legal terrain look like in terms of um, inhibiting either fraudulent medical advice or undue, even an undue burden potentially? So that is, it's difficult. Um, as I mentioned, it's, there's not um, one great bill that you can pass that makes CPCs illegal or bans them from um, misleading patients or anything like that, because in, they're often not violating any laws in the state. Um, and they do have first amendment rights to set up shop and speak to patients and instruct them and give advice. Um, so, and they often will claim that they're not providing medical care beyond what their licensure or lack of licensure would allow them to. They sometimes do have um, physicians on staff if that's required, if they're providing ultrasounds. Um, but we find in reality that oftentimes the folks, yes, maybe they do have a physician on staff, but the person that's actually reading that ultrasound is is not qualified or is misleading someone. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, because this is it's tricky. Again, a, a lot of states don't require ultrasound um, text to be licensed to read an ultrasound. And that is something that um, a, a lot of our providers and other abortion providers need ultrasound technicians and don't want to have to implement strict licensure requirements when they're trying to do the best that they can to provide care. Um, so it, there are not very easy, clear ways to get at CPCs. The biggest things that we've seen work so far, number one, a lot of states fund CPCs in their state budget. So the easiest way in those states to limit act, the ability of CPCs to spread misinformation is to cut state funding so that the state is not using state and federal dollars. Um, actually, a lot of TANF funding ends up going to CPCs. So limiting the budget line items um, for CPCs is a, is a key thing to, to push for in states that are still funding CPCs. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, another, another goal is getting at their marketing and advertising um, as misleading under 
under um, laws that are targeting basically that you can't mislead consumers. Um, there have been laws in the past that were passed to require disclosure of the type of facility it was or the lack their lack of providers present. Um, and some of those have been blocked, namely in California. And so it's tricky to, to encourage states to, to pass those laws now. Um, but yeah, I think right now, um, getting at funding and getting at their, their public claims, their advertising and marketing is the most effective. Thanks, Kali. I want to um, encourage the, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to um, questions and answers from the audience. And so I want to um, encourage you to use the Q&A function for that. Um, in the meantime, and I want to go back to you to ask a little bit about the differential effects that you mentioned in response to the CPCs, which is, um, is this, I mean, this is a, so pervasive that I, I hear you saying it's affecting all women in Texas, um, but are you seeing differential effects for, um, and I would imagine that this would be the case for poor women, for women on, who live in rural areas, for women of color? Yeah, so um, just to be fair, Fun Texas Choice doesn't do any means testing, so we don't actually know the income of our uh, of our clients, and that's, that's purposeful um, because when you think about a, anyone needing to pay two thousand dollars in a matter of a couple of weeks to get two of their abortion and back and hotels and things like that, it you could have a lot, you could be well above the poverty line and still not be able to. Um, pay $2,000 out of your pocket immediately. Um, so we don't do means testing, but yes, does this impact low income folks more? 1,000% um, because they're the ones that potentially are on um, hourly jobs. Um, so they can't necessarily take off of work um, with, uh, without making without knowing that it's going to impact how much they bring in that week. Um, they're also less likely to be able to get time off of work um, because they don't have those kinds of benefits. Um, um, and we as a nation have created systemic issues um, and we've had systematic problems that are, and this law is meant to impact, right? So that folks that already are struggling to make ends meet will continue to struggle to make ends meet because if they're forced to carry their pregnancy to term, they will have another child, another mouth to feed, another thing to do that they potentially couldn't do in the first place. Um, so it does impact um, folks that are making ends meet way more. Um, and in terms of um, the makeup um, or the ethnic makeup of our clients, 70% of our clients are Black, Indigenous, or other people of color. It, so it does impact them pretty significantly. Um, I, I'm not sure how many, how much the folks know about Hyde Amendment. I hope that folks do. But, you know, when I hear that speech over, when I've heard, I've heard that speech over and over again, um, that was made to kind of implore Congress to pass the Hyde Amendment, like, it, it specifically says, we can't, we can't stop wealthy folks from going and getting their abortion. They're gonna be able to do it anyway. Uh, so let's protect the, the unborn of the poor. Um, and, and when you think about it from that perspective, it, these laws were meant to particularly keep people in the places they were, um, they are to continue to create those systemic issues. Um, so they can't get out um, and it becomes cyclical. And so it does impact particular groups a lot. Um, and it impacts LGBTQIA folks because there are lots of folks that don't identify as women, um, but can also get abortions because we we practice the non-binary model, right? Like you can be non-binary, you can be um, a transgender person seeking abortions, but they're also unable to convince folks that, hey, I have a right to access abortion. So it ends up kind of, impacting so many different groups. Um, and and, and it, again, that's the point. Um, it's meant to continue to harm the folks that have already been harmed so that they are unable to move beyond the harm that has been, um, that has been, uh, that they've been forced to endure. Yeah, and I, uh, thank you. I've been referring to the, people who are pregnant as pregnant women, but you're absolutely right. Not all of them are women. And I want to acknowledge that. Um, Steve, I want to, well, I want to, this is actually a question for all of you. It's a, there's a bunch of different questions that came 
up you know, when people registered and it they're all variations on this very um odd and sort of dystopic structure of SB8 from is this the Salem is this a version of the Salem witch trials to um how is it that you can give someone standing to um challenge other people's constitutional rights and so i'm i i would love to just there sort of you alluded steve to the um an inverse situation where californians might be deputized to challenge gun rights for example of uh other private citizens in California. I'm, I, I want to sort of have us muse out loud about what this looks like and um, and the extent to like, where does it lead uh, in terms of social order and legality? Um, I mean, it leads to a world where state legislatures win. Um, and you know, that means that our constitutional rights will mean one thing in Texas and something else in New Mexico and something else in Arizona and something else in California. And I think it's not hard to imagine why that's disruptive. Um, part of why we have a constitution is to avoid that. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think, I mean, I'm assuming, of course, Naomi, that other state legislatures will be as deeply cynical as Texas. Um, and maybe that's not true. But at some point, this becomes a race to the bottom, um, which is why, you know, to me, at least part of the story here is as much about, you know, punishing this regime as it is about, um, you know, the, the sort of the denial of abortion access specifically. Sorry, I muted. Um, it, it does lead to the question that I think so many of us were surprised about, which is why the Supreme Court justices apart from Roberts were not seeing this as such a direct challenge to their institutional legitimacy and that was one of the questions that also came up um it doesn't seem like it takes that much imagination to to see where this leads yeah I mean I think they're you know they probably just don't think they've decided that yet um, I mean, I, I think that was exactly why the chief dissent, I think exactly why he would have intervened when he did. Um, and I think, you know, their view is probably like, you know, we'll find a way in the right case to, to strike down the law we want to strike down. But it also, Naomi, gives them cover to, you know, allow states to violate those rights that they don't care us as much about um, while reserving the ability to step in. This, I mean, this gets to one of my larger objections about the rise of the shadow docket, which is the less the court explains itself, the easier it is for the justices to just pick and choose and not be bound to apply the same rules equally to red states and blue states. So that's, you know, I suspect that's part of the phenomenon here, but I also think that it doesn't, you know, there's value to them in not binding themselves to, the, to decide the future cases in advance. I, maybe for those uh, who are not um, part of the law school, you might explain just very briefly what the shadow docket is and why it allows for um, this sort of, why it's shadowy. Yeah, I mean, so this, it's, it's a term that people used to refer to the orders, the court issues, as opposed to the big fancy opinions. It's usually for emergency applications where a party is seeking relief from a lower court order temporarily just to freeze the status quo or unfreeze the status quo as the case works its way through the court. And so when we have these kinds of constitutional challenges to laws as they're going into effect, we often see, especially lately, you know, the sort of not the full case got to the Supreme Court quickly, but the sort of what is the status quo going to be while the case is litigated, that issue is getting to the Supreme Court faster and faster. We're seeing more and more decisions from the Supreme Court in that context. Without explanations or with minimalist explanations. Yeah, I mean, with variable explanations. I mean, so in the SB8 case, we got a paragraph. Um, sometimes we get a couple pages. Sometimes we get a one sentence order. And, and you know, that's where I think some of the problems really do start to arise. Um, I'm, this may be a question more for Anna and Kali, but Steve, I know you're in Texas as well. A, a lot of the um, questions were also variations on what, what can we do? 
And what can we do to help in Texas? What can we do to help elsewhere? Um, what can Georgetown students do? There's, a, there's this sense of anxiety, urgency. I'm assuming that um, you all, both at the national level of Planned Parenthood and at the local level of Fund Texas Choice are seeing an influx of funds. Um, but I think people also wanna do more than give money. And I would love to sort of maybe offer some concrete advice about what that looks like. And then this, the part of this that goes to you, Steve, um, is, you know, what does this mean for law students um, and how might they be involved in more concrete ways as well? I, I'd love to hear from Callie and Anna first, but I'm, I'm happy to weigh in. I, I think this is tricky. I think in some ways, all of us wish we could do more, um, but, it, I, I mean, I'll first, this is probably a plug that she, maybe Anna doesn't want to give herself, but I will give. Um, local abortion funds are incredibly powerful and very important. Um, and it's not just about giving money. You can also get involved in your local abortion fund, um, doing research about the type of work that they do and their process is important. Um, I think some have gotten a lot of money and probably could use help figuring out how to get it to patients that really need it. Um, so doing research on that, I think is a good place to start. I also think, I mean, all of this, this all comes down to state legislatures and I think people don't pay enough attention to them. Um, their people are not engaged. These people, legislators are elected with low turnout. Um, they don't get a lot of social um, investment and involvement in their work. People don't become aware of what bills are introduced until they've already passed and been enacted. Um, and so I know that it seems a little bit silly to say like, call your state legislator, but genuinely these people, are, they're not getting as many calls as you think they are. <laughs> they don't have that as many people really putting pressure on them as you think they do. Um, and it can make a difference pushing. I mean, it, what I said before, I think is very true that the social that the media, that the like public response to SBA will make it a much different landscape for other states to pass these bills. And that is because people are, are loud about this. They are protesting, they're, they're making their opinions known, they're posting to social media, they are, you know, they're pushing to sign petitions. Those, and those actions, they, they feel small in a sense, but it really creates a national aura of like, this is not what we want. And this is going to look bad for your state to fight to pass this bill. So being on top of what other states are introducing these copycat bills and pushing in, you know, in involvement in that state, reaching out to people that are, that are from there and contacting state legislators there, those things make a difference, especially if you can get to them before the bill is actually far along um, in, in the state legislator process. Yeah, and I'll echo pretty much, I think Callie covered it really well. Um, I will just add that um, when you do reach out to the local funds, like I think that is actually the best way to do it because in your state, they're the ones that are on the ground um, seeing what's happening and able to um, do the work and know how to do the work. Um, and so they, if they cease to exist, it's a lot more difficult in that state that's already passed something like this. Um, so it's always important to talk to them and see what they need. Um, FTC, for example, can't take on volunteers right now. We're a team of two. I can't manage volunteers right now because of everything else we're doing. Um, and, and yes, people keep saying, what can we do outside of money? But as I mentioned earlier, we're spending over a thousand dollars per client. Um, that's ten thousand dollars a week. Um, and so, even if we're getting an influx in donations, the dollars are going out immediately. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, and then um, check check your legislative session every year too, whenever it's happening, and actually pay attention to what's being proposed. It does sound legalese, but like. Texas, for example, has a two line blurb of every law um, that gets that gets proposed. And so you can kind of understand that, oh, this is regarding abortion access, this is regarding gun rights, this is regarding X. Um, and then pay attention to that. 
watch the hearings and hear what the other side is saying, because that actually has an impact on how the law is going to be passed and what might be included in the final resolution of the bill. Um, I, this is, this is my first Texas legislative session um, in this work. I used to practice law before this. Um, and I, my experience in the Texas legislature was next to nothing before in terms of like actually listening to the um, hearings. I used to read all the bills and stuff and pay attention to what was being passed. But when I listened to what the other side was arguing, um, it was infuriating, right? Um, and if more people are doing it outside of just the folks in the organization and the movement work, um, you'll be able to understand why these laws are horrible and they might pick up steam long before they're enacted and can potentially gain that national public outcry ahead of time. Um, and then, um, and so that's kind of like where, where that stands. The other thing is, is try not to recreate the wheel. I know we asked what can we do? And this is kind of like what not to do, but it is an action of doing um, because what we've heard folks saying is, oh, I'm gonna create my own practical support organization now. Um, but there are folks that are already doing that work. Um, so maybe working with them instead and seeing how can you support them specifically. Thank you so much. And, and um, uh, I wanna go to you, Steve, to ask about maybe legal activism. Um, but I also wanted to note that from the chat that Georgetown has a center and Meryl Chernoff um, uh, note, noted that the Georgetown Project on State and Local Government Policy and Law is glad to lend support in state legislative processes. So um, Steve, what do, you, what do you think about maybe more um, law specific interventions? Well, I, I, I guess at the risk of, of saying something nerdy, I think what this all underscores is why procedure matters. Um, and, and so to the, to the lawyers and the prospective lawyers and the law students, you know, don't shy away from the classes about legal procedure because, you know, legal procedure is often used the way that drunk sees lampposts for support, not for illumination. Um, and I think SB8 is a really, especially aggressive example of that, but not uh, not the only one. So, you know, this is why you should take federal courts, even if you're not going to do a federal clerkship. This is why you should take civil procedure seriously, even if you don't think you're going to be a practicing litigator, because, you know, our legal system is structured in a way where the parties that set the procedural rules basically, you know, control so much of the dice. And I mean, back to Callie's point, like, folks who understand when these bills are being enacted, how the procedural traps are going to work. Um, we need more of them. As a civil procedure professor, I thank you um, for that endorsement. And um, absolutely, uh, plus one to all of that. I, I want to really highlight um, a comment from our uh, Georgetown faculty member, Joe Morrison, who says there is indeed a historical model for the private citizen uh, as deputy. And that was the when they were deputized to capture enslaved humans who had escaped from their enslavers. Freed black folks were also captured and sold into slavery. And I think that that's not a coincidental antecedent to this, right? And and um, I think there is real reason to think about the ways in which we, um, we support, acknowledge, and, and, and like vigilantism to work for us when it works against those who we perceive to be less fully human, less fully citizen, less fully autonomous. Um, and I, and I, I wondered if you wanted to speak to that particular um, history. I can say a bit. I mean, the the you know the Fugitive Slave Act of nineteen uh, of eighteen fifty is you know among the most reprehensible statutes in in the United States history. One of my favorite reprehensible things it does is the bounties it creates. Uh, the commissioners receive ten dollars if they found that the person was in fact a slave, and five dollars if they found that they weren't, um, which sets up a rather unequal system here. Um, the difference is that um, that was sort of a universe 
where the law required the courts to operate, where the effect of the law required um, some kind of review, even if the review was skewed, Naomi. Um, the whole point of SB8 is to chill the providers out of business without review, right? The whole, the whole point of SB8 and of shifting enforcement to private parties in this context is actually to keep this out of the courts as much as possible in ways that even with private enforcement, the fugitive slave law was the opposite, was only enforced through courts. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I would never suggest that SBA is somehow more ominous, uh, more ominous than, than the Fugitive Slave Act. But I do think that systemically and structurally, that is to me the larger sort of difference and, and ominous implication here is sort of the notion that we can somehow just through procedural tricks, cut courts out of the loop when it comes to enforcing what the Constitution says. I'll just make one other comment about the private right of action piece and how we frame it. I, I do think it's important to recognize that this is unprecedented and clearly that it's being used um, in a way that we think is intended to violate the Constitution. And I think that's a really important flag because um, I don't want the takeaway to be that private rights of action are always ominous or always something that's being used in an aggressive way that is intended to skirt the law. Um, there are instances in state law and other areas where private rights of action are a natural way of pursuing claims um, and they make total sense. I think the important part here is that the only reason the private right of action exists in this bill is to get around the enforcement of it being deemed unconstitutional, which it is. Um, and I think that, that that ties in to a bigger theme here, which is that, yes, SB8 is notorious and it's unique because of the private right of action, but the, the key element of SB8 is that it is an abortion ban. Women in Texas are banned from having an abortion right now. It is, that is what the impact is. It, there is a lot of legal jargon around it, and it will be very important for our, our jurisprudence in our country and the way that... Um, different laws are enforced throughout our history, like this isn't going to be legally doctrinally important, but the impact here is that Texas has been allowed to pass an unconstitutional abortion ban, and in this moment, women in Texas are being denied abortions. I just don't want that to, that like reality to get lost in the legal jargon, I guess. Uh, I point taken and appreciated, right? They're, they're, by failing to block the law, and in part that failure was a reaction to this legal technicality built into the procedural um, uh, weapon built into the law, there are not abortions being performed for most people who need abortions in Texas. Um, right. just, despite the fact, right, that it's both a constitutional right and it's a constitutional right against states imposing undue burdens. Sorry, Anna, go ahead. No, 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 sorry. And, and when we talk about states, we also should be looking at like local municipalities and like what local municipalities are doing. I know this is like a legal argument, legal jargon, but municipalities can actually have impact on lots of things that are being passed and what they can be doing. I bring this back up because I was thinking about what's being said of like what, how we historically have had models of what we can and can't do or what we've done as a country. Um, but there's also like future and forward thinking of what we can do as a country. Um, and for example, the city of Austin has funded, their municipality funds client practical support. Um, we are a recipient of a grant that we can help like Austin residents and Travis County residents get to their abortion. Um, and, you know, right now there's the there's ARPA funding that's not tied, federal dollars not tied to the Hyde Amendment. Looking at what your cities are doing with those dollars and seeing if they're passing resolutions um, uh, disavowing SB8 or denouncing SB8, it's kind of like what Portland did, right? Portland was talking about doing a boycott of Texas and then they decided instead of doing a boycott of Texas, they're going to take, divest money and put it back into abortion um, providers and abortion orgs in Portland. Um, and this all matters because then you have historical changes, right? You're making historical changes that are different than the ones that we have in history of what we've done. Thank you so much for that, Anna. I wanna, um, uh, oh wait, there's another question that just came in. If sued, do physicians have the ability to have a defense by sharing patient information or would that be impossible due to limitations of HIPAA? 
um, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know the answer to that. I'm assuming you could not share private patient. So HIPAA actually has exceptions for court, for litigation when um, patient information is relevant. Likely a court would consider patient information if it was relevant to determining um, a violation, but it would, courts oftentimes put in protections in place, um, like sealing those documents so that they don't become public if they do have um, protected patient health information in them. I did notice in the in SBA some very concrete language about what limitations on a number of defenses and reporting mechanisms for why abortions are performed um, anytime outside the the detection of fetal heart rate. Um, the I I wanted to give each of you I, I'm I want to wrap up by. 120 if possible. And I wanted to give each of you just a, a minute or two to say anything else you wanted to say. Um, it's it's an incredibly depressing and demoralizing conversation, but it's also really important. And I feel like you're providing us with how important it is to make sure there's not an, a kind of engagement or enthusiasm gap between the those who are fighting to restrain constitutional rights and those of us who um, want to support them. So I really appreciate the, the expertise and, and insight you all have brought to that. Let me go around in the same order, let you say anything else you think has been missing from the conversation or that you want to emphasize. And um, I'll go back and, and start with you, Anna. Um, I think collectively we've said a lot, and I think that um, one of the things that I go back to is um, support your local abortion fund. I know we've already said it, but I think that's a really important thing to continue to highlight um, and continue talking about this beyond the news cycle. Um, it's one month tomorrow that the strictest abortion ban has been in place. Um, and I can't tell you how many Texans have probably not been able to access care. Um, so continue talking about it so that it doesn't happen um, in your state or anywhere else um, because we can't forget about what is happening on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Steve? I, I, I don't think I have much to add. I'll just say that like, I think it's important to keep having these conversations and not let this sort of slide out of the news. Thank you, Steve. Kelly? Um, uh, I, I think that I'll go back to just remembering the human element of this. Um, I was in Oklahoma this week speaking to patients who have traveled from Texas and it was incredibly, um, sad and disturbing and traumatic for these people. And it was not, uh, it really, it puts a face to a name. And I think that, um, as much you, as you can do to, to read about the impact that this is actually happening, to engage on it before it happens in other places. And to remember that this is one element of sexual and reproductive health care that people don't have access to. There are so many more. Um, in Texas, especially, this it's so cruel that this is happening there when abortion providers have been cut out of Medicaid. So the number of people that now need to have an abortion because they couldn't afford contraception and they can't have contraception covered because there are so few providers in Texas and their state providing contraception. Um, it, it's a it's a horrible circle that people are being put into, um, and so this is this is one piece of a big puzzle of you know the push that we need to have around social engagement to increase access to sexual and reproductive health care in our country. Thank you, Callie, and thank you to all of you so much for lending us your time, your your passion, your hard work on these issues, and and all of your insights. Um, the, the last thing I'll add is there's, a, for those of us in DC, there's a march on Saturday and, um, and, and um, I'm really just enormously grateful for how much more we know and understand um, thanks to the three of you. I'll just plug that the march is actually happening in all 50 states. So if you're not in DC and you wanna find the place where you, the march is happening, you can find it online. Yeah, and, and sorry about that. It's, of course it is, because that's how marches happen now. 
<laughs> um, as it should. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.